So yeah, today, uh, as promised, uh, we're going to talk about data collection and how it should make users happy first and enable supervised learning second. But first, let's before we get properly started, here's a bit of a teaser trailer uh, of what's in store. So there's something that anesthetic, penicillin, and better Clio budget retention have in common. Find out what it is after the break except there isn't a break, but that felt like a cool thing to say. Instead, uh, find out in about 12 or 13 slides time. So who and what is Clio? So Clio is all the things this slide says, but most importantly, uh, it's a chatbot. And the persona of the chatbot that users interact with is filled with personality, uh, uses a casual tone of voice to try to break down the stigma and fear around personal finance. And ultimately reminds me of that friend who's kind of who really has your back but will also challenge you on your bs um, and a crucial part of the mission is that clio is fighting for the world's financial health so clio hasn't been designed to work for people in financially stable positions only it's designed to work for those whose financial health isn't in great shape and it's the challenges that those users face that drive what we build and how we build it and our vision is to be able to onboard people to clio who are just starting to experience the world of money, perhaps people studying and working part-time, for example. And the vision is for Clio to be able to coach those people through their current challenges and helping them reach the next of a series of financial milestones, things like saving money, things like maybe buying a flat or buying a house or buying a car. And this year we decided to give some love to a part of the product designed for people right at the beginning of that journey. So the budget feature, so we'd actually had a budget feature for a few years, but we knew it needed some work. So from user research and some quick early iterations that initially involved sending our early beta users spreadsheets over email, we, uh, we realized that this should work by, by tracking a user spending against some sort of spending target, by showing them what they're spending their money on, and crucially telling them how much they've got left before they need, uh, sorry, how much they've got left before they get paid next. And then we can also do things like warn them about when things aren't looking great. Uh, and we can help users form positive habits that will help, help them improve their financial health over time. So we had to work on three things in order to get this right. So we had to use limits. So this is the idea that the budget needs to know how much a given user wants to spend. For this iteration, we decided to leave that for users to decide because that wasn't something that we wanted to weigh in on. Um, there might be a future where we take into account a user's longer term goals and their current position, and then give them an assist with this by suggesting a limit that will, that will contribute to their long term goals, but that wasn't what we wanted to do for now. The second component is income. So this is really important because we need to be able to predict when a user will get paid and recognize that payment when it actually comes in. And that's harder than it sounds. And we need this so the budget can be refreshed to show relevant information for for between now and the next time they get paid. And the last component is bills. So we need to tell a user how much they have left to spend that is discretionary. It's no use saying to a user, you have 500 pounds or dollars left to spend for the month when they know that 200 of those is going to go to rent or utilities. And it's also useful for a user to know how much they're planning to keep up with their bills. On video chats in user research, users have told us, users have shown us um, elaborate like notebooks and spreadsheets that they use to help manage their bills. So centralizing these into the budget was another thing we wanted to get right. Uh, so yeah, when a user sets up, sets up the budget, uh, they, with the help of some of our existing machine learning tooling, they select their income and their bills. And these normally have a history that we can use to build up a picture of what each bill and income has typically looked like in the past. For example, we might see that their Netflix bill is normally a certain amount of dollars, or that they normally get paid every second Friday. We then use that, that data to extrapolate and predict future bill and income payments that feed in to the budget. The hard bit, as we discovered, was detecting new transactions that matched these various income and bills. Uh, but here's how we'd actually been doing it up until this point. So users connect Clio uh, to their bank accounts, and that allows us to pull their transactions several times a day and so what we, what we would do is whenever we pulled new transactions, we would check each transactions one by one, and we'd run, a set, run them against a set of rules to see if any of those transactions should be tagged with 
any of that user's big bills or incomes. So there are a few conditions that these things have to pass through. So the first thing we do is we would look at the monetary, the, the, the kind of currency amount of the new transaction, and we would compare that to the average amount that we'd seen from the previously linked transactions. And so this first condition is saying, if that amount is within 20% of, you know, below that amount we expect, and if it's within 20% above, so if both of those conditions pass, basically if the amount is within 20% of what we expect, then we get a pass. And then the transaction goes through more conditions. So the next kind of set of conditions is around the dates. So it's very similar. So we basically, as I said, we forecast the date we expect the payment to be on. And if the new transaction is at most five days early or late, then we pass through that condition as well. And then we go to the last condition. And here what we do is we have our own Clio internal mechanism for what we call merchants, which is kind of basically a shop. And we extract that for all the previous transactions and we extract it for the new transaction. And if they match as well, uh, if, then all these conditions pass and we label something as a bill. So we were curious how effective these rules were. So we manually went through some transactions that had passed through all of these conditions and we checked whether they were correct. And almost all of the time they were. We also looked at users who'd missed their pay date though, for both bills and income. And we combed through their transactions to see whether any of the transactions that had been rejected at some stage by these rules, whether they actually should have made it through. And unfortunately, that was a common mistake. Uh, so in machine learning terminology, this meant that our precision was great, but our recall, not so much. So let's try to visualize this. So if you consider this two-dimensional representation of transactions, some of which are bills and some of which aren't. These conditions were basically being very strict in terms of what they were allowing to pass through and get tagged as a bill or an income. So most of the rules, uh, so most, mo most things the rules let through were indeed bills, but users were paying, paying lots of bills that we weren't recognizing. A similar thing was also happening on the income side, um, but it wasn't as extreme, but it was still there. So let's take another look at the conditions and see if this makes sense. Uh, and it does. I mean, the, the, as I said before, it's because the rules are pretty strict. So if a user, for example, is paying their energy bill, uh, that is bound to fluctuate, right? Um, you know, if a user is paying for an energy bill and we've seen the transactions that occurred over winter and then suddenly, you know, they get to turn off their heating in summer, um, then that's obviously going to mean that, that energy bill could be drastically lower and it could easily fall outside that 20% window. Uh, another example, if a user takes some time off from their part-time work uh, and they skip an income payment, the next one will probably be more than five days late or more than five days after we expected because we're just skipping one in the cycle. Um, and that means that with these rules, we also won't recognize their income. So it's important to consider the user impact as well of these mistakes. So let's look at that. So the first thing is let's look at what happens when we have low recall on bills. So this would basically be a user paying the bill, but Clio wouldn't recognize it. Instead, we'd assume they spent money, which would reduce their left to spend amount that we show them, while we'd be also be showing them that they're overdue in paying a bill, and this could be quite stressful. On the income side, what would low recall mean? So a user would get paid, but everything in the budget would be referencing a date that's no longer relevant. We'd be showing bills for the period just gone, not the next period and our left to spend per day would be wrong. Essentially, it would break the budget. So we knew we wanted to improve recall, but we didn't want to overcorrect. Um, and in an effort to increase recall at all costs, sacrifice much precision. And there's good reason for that. So here's why. So what would be the user impact of low precision on bills? So imagine a user has a meal out. Low precision means that we mistakenly think it's a utilities bill. So we don't count the spending against their limit because we just cross it off against the bill. We instead take it off against the bill and the user thinks that they've got more left to spend than they actually do. And they think they've paid that bill when in fact they haven't. Uh, and this would be quite risky because it could uh, cause overspending. Plus if a user is relying on Clio to keep up with their bills, they might risk action from their utility supplier who hasn't been paid while the user thinks it's all, it's all good. And then lastly, so income, uh, low precision on income would give you a similar issue to low recall on income, which is that the budget would get reset early with an incorrect amount. Uh, that means the left to spend by the next date would be wrong. The next predicted date would be wrong. Um, basically, 
not a good experience. <clears throat> so with these concerns in mind, we had to decide what approach would be right for this problem. And we realized that this rules-based approach had its major limitations. So to help you understand that, consider this. So consider a user who has paid a really steady bill and suddenly that user pays for something. And it looks like it could be for that bill, but the amount's different. How do we decide what to do? With the old rules, we just compare the new amount to the past average and have no way of incorporating the fact that previous variation in amount had been basically zero. So knowing that might push us towards rejecting this as a bill payment. But how about this? The expected amount would be the same, but now the new amount is much more in line with the previously observed distribution. And to my eyes, this looks like something that much more likely fits the bill. Get it? Fits the bill? Talking about bills. Anyway, um, if all our users had stable and predictable bills and salaries, uh, this would be easy to solve with these simple rules. But as I said in the beginning, Clio isn't just built for those of us fortunate enough to have our payments behave this way. If a user works part time and therefore gets paid sporadically, we need to cater for this. If a user splits their energy bill with their flatmate and sometimes has to pay it late, we need to cater for that. So we decided to build a machine learning solution for this problem, and that, that had a few benefits. So the first one was that we were able to take user context into account. Uh, we could engineer features to take uh, into account various dimensions of past observed behavior and let the model learn the appropriate associations with whether a transaction, transaction should be tagged as a bill or income payment or not. Second, interactions between features. So we might find that certain types of income payment, for example, tend to be very regular and others less so. And then another good thing about the ML approach was threshold tuning. So we knew there was a fine balance to strike between precision and recall. And the continuous range of scores machine learning models provide would give us the ability to be very intentional about how we wanted to strike this balance. <clears throat> but we didn't have any training data, which is a major limitation in supervised learning. So we went on a quest to find some. So we considered a few ways of doing this. So the first was manual labeling. We'd done this for a few other problems in Clio and it had worked quite well. Uh, an obvious downside though is that it's quite expensive and time consuming. But another downside is that the quality is limited by the idiosyncrasies of our users and their payment patterns. If a user pays for a bill by transferring to their friend, this is hard for us to recognize because we don't know a user's transactions and how they arrange their money. The second thing we considered was use existing data. So <clears throat> users leave a substantial digital footprint in Clio. Um, for example, users are able to recategorize transactions once we've categorized them. And we've used that in the past to produce ground truth labels for a machine learning category classifier. So for this example, what we could do is look at the budget engagement, look at churned users, assume that they'd assume that we'd missed their income when they'd received it and that they'd churned because the budget wasn't working for them anymore. And then we could retrospectively try and identify a large credit transaction and just assume that was their income and train the model on that. But you know, you can easily see that you need a lot of assumptions to get there. And if you do that, you're probably going to end up with training data that's well, as per the illustration, a bit crappy. So uh, the third option was asking our users directly. We knew that the quality would be the best it could be probably because users know their data better than we do. And, uh, but the risk to that is that, especially if done badly, this could be quite intrusive to the user experience. No one really likes filling out forms. Um, so we went with the third option of asking our users. And we built, so the way we did this is we built what we call chat flows for users where we send them a notification with some prompt. And if they engage with the notification, the app opens and Clio asks users to tell us if we got their incomes and bills right. And we broke that down into two types of chat flow. The first one, so if we tagged a transaction as a bill or an income payment, this chat flow would ask users whether we were correct to do that. The second one, was if we went past the expected payment date without recognizing a bill or income transaction, we gave the users the opportunity to go down the other chat flow, which gave them the chance to tell us which transaction we should have tagged, if any. 
And the first of these is basically measuring our precision. Uh, and the second is, is basically looking at recall. And as you can see from the data that we started being able to collect, um, it confirmed what we'd, it confirmed on mass what we'd seen before anecdotally. And uh, even though we were only getting small quantities of data, there was still much more than we could generate manually. So before we knew it, uh, we had a few thousand annotations, a few thousand data points, not exactly big data, but enough to train a small machine learning model with a limited feature set. So you might be curious how the model performed in the wild. But before we get to that, let's go back to that exciting question I asked at the beginning. What do anesthetic, penicillin, and better Clio budget retention have in common? The answer is that they were all happy accidents. So Horace Wells, an American dentist, while at a 19th century party where guests were experimenting with laughing gas, noticed that someone who'd injured themselves didn't seem to notice and decided to try it as an anesthetic after. And it turns out it was only powerful enough for minor dental work, but still a cool discovery. Returning from holiday while trying to find something which could prevent infection and deep wounds, which antiseptic was rubbish at, Alexander Fleming removed the tops of some old Petri dishes and noticed that the bacteria he'd grown were being killed by a mold. And this fueled the discovery of penicillin. Uh, and we had our own happy accident, not maybe as globally impactful, uh, but one we're still pretty happy with. So once we started collecting data, but before we had a machine learning model in production actually doing stuff, we saw user metrics were actually getting better. So we did some investigation and it turned out users who had been given the chance to fix a missed income payment or bill were actually retaining better than they had before because their budgets hadn't broken. We were only actually alerted to this as well because we were working so closely with other functions across the other functions than data science like user research and product. So we took a deeper look at what was going on and we found this. So of the users, we were asking if we'd missed their income payment. Just under a third of them not only told us that we had missed it, but were also able to tell us which transaction we should have recognized as their income. And this meant the budget which would have broken for these users if they'd not been able to correct those things was now functioning. And we also had success when we deployed our shiny new machine learning model. We saw an increase in recall as we wanted with only a small sacrifice to precision. But then we realized we could double down on what we've been doing so far with some active learning. So let's return to that two-dimensional representation of bills. Uh, with the model, we were able to draw a decision boundary between what we thought were bills and what we thought were not bills. So let's think back to how I described one of those chat flows where we don't detect a payment and we ask users to tell us if we missed something. When users told us we had missed something, we were just showing them the most recent three transactions and users generally transact a lot. So it was always quite unlikely that we would get lucky and that the three we happened to show them contained something that should have been matched. And if we think to the other chat flow where we recognize a bill or income payment and ask a user to confirm, we would randomly select the users we asked to do this. And generally we saw that, you know, over half of real, real bill payments and income payments, we were getting, the model was getting right quite easily. So this random selection was providing training data on the examples the model was already doing quite well at. So we then realized that for the first chat flow, when we asked users to tell us which payment we should have identified, we could use the model to identify transactions whose scores were just low enough for those transactions to not have been identified at the time. And for the second chat flow, we realized we could, instead of randomly sampling users, we could sample users whose transactions were ad we identified as bills uh, just, and we had, sorry, we could um, sample users whose transactions had just made it above the threshold that we defined for what is a bill. And then the benefit of this is the model would have a better understanding of that murky area in the middle where predictions are harder to get right. So we did the former of these for bills and incomes, and it really did help um, on the bill side, but we really saw a bigger improvement on the income side. So this change meant that significantly more users were able to fix their budget. And we're currently in the process of adding functionality to allow users to proactively do this rather than have to wait for us to sample them and send them a notification. 
And our, our machine learning metrics improved as a result of getting more valuable data, which in turn has helped our user metrics even more since we're getting more of these decisions right in the first place. Uh, as for the second change, it's actually on our roadmap to implement this, where we more intelligently target users to confirm we got things right. Um, but we're confident that we'll get more valuable data from users and that the process will be more valuable for them as a result as well. So what did that give us uh, overall? Um, what value did it bring us? So as I said in the last slide, better model performance has obviously led to better user outcomes because people's budgets are more up-to-date and more accurate. The second thing uh, is that users are happier, both in terms of us getting things right, but also having the ability to self-resolve um, and also self-resolve in an engaging way. Um, but the third most powerful thing is the synergy between these two benefits is, is really the key. Uh, and that allows for quicker improvements across the board because of the compounding effects of having a more accurate model, which makes the, the sampling more useful for users, which then gives us better data to train a more accurate model. So what did we learn? So the main thing we learned is this. So people often think you need to get good quality data in order to start building a supervised learning model. And then you do that in order to improve the user experience. But we found, admittedly by accident, that you can start with improving the user experience and that this very improvement can give you that better data that you need, which kicks off this virtuous cycle. But there are a couple of other things that we also learned along the way as well. So one is, since we streamlined training and deployment process into one pipeline of our models, deploying newly trained models uh, with that newly collected user data was pretty quick. And we have continuous training as a thing we want to implement, which would have made this even smoother. Now, the second thing is that users know their data best and hearing from them directly is likely to give you the best quality data because they're the experts. And thirdly, and this one's really important, so I've gone a bit over the top with a thumbs up. We were working really closely with engineers, product, user research, UX writers, and more throughout this period of budget improvement. And it was really thanks to that collaboration that we not only were able to build the chat flows, but also noticed the improvement to overall budget level metrics. I think it's easy for data scientists to work in a vacuum and have tunnel vision on improving area under the curve or some other machine learning metric, but keeping user metrics close enabled us to notice and then leverage effects that AUC alone would have missed. Um, so that's it really, as a final plug, if the sort of work uh, and approaches to problems I've been describing appeal to you, uh, please pay a quick visit to our career site where you'll see several open positions across data science and Clio in general. And that is all I have to say. So thank you for listening. Perfect. Thank you very much, George. Uh, virtual round of applause. Uh, definitely man I miss live events sometimes say eh? but um yeah if you enjoyed that please jump into the chat G give us that virtual round of applause uh it is very much appreciated by by all of our speakers and I can already see that Amma Davis is in there saying great job so thank you very much for jumping on Amma uh, Anthony coming through there thanks Josh uh, and we'll keep an eye on that as I'm sure a few more will come in uh, Zaha, uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, this was very insightful. So uh, vir literally a virtual round of applause for, for Matthew Hale, uh, also Laura, Emiliano, Abby, Kamal, uh, all clap, clap in. So Josh, thank you very much. Um, really uh, interesting talk. Uh, and actually, if I may say so, your presentation style uh, was very engaging. So uh, yeah, re really enjoyed the session, man. And um, we have got the Q&A open. Um, I've uh, been taking a few notes as we've been going along, so I've definitely got a couple of questions which I'll kick things off with. Um, if anyone else does have questions for Josh, uh, now is the time. Uh, get them into that Q&A, please. So um, I'm going to start off, Josh, by playing devil's advocate a little bit, um, and perhaps it is my personality uh, more than anything else. Um, but I was wondering, you know, as you're asking users um, to give you this data uh, and, and help you, you know, tell you if you've got things right or not. Um, have you noticed any bad quality data uh, arising from users clicking randomly? Um, ha have you had people just, you know, randomly clicking away and perhaps giving you the wrong information? Um, and if so, um, you know, what, what have you done about that? Yeah, so we've, uh, you know, I, I did give a whole spiel about data quality being great and by and large it is, but yeah, it's a good point. So we have noticed, you know, there are some, some users who will pay for you know, a Starbucks, and we can clearly see it's a Starbucks, 
and they'll just say, yeah, this was my water bill. Like, no, it's not. Um, so yeah, we've noticed it. Um, the So we do have it as a plan to kind of analyze it in terms of, you know, looking at whether there are ways we can identify it um, and then adjust our training data and our valuation data appropriately. Um, for example, you know, could we look at the way that, you know, the, the timings, does a user that's doing that, um, is there a correlation between the quality of the data and how quickly a person gets through that? Or is there a correlation between the quality of data and if they're trying to <clears throat> do other things? Basically, is there a way to identify it to clean our data a bit? But that said, we also don't really think it's going to negatively affect things too much. Um, and that's because we've got, you know, it's quite a simple model. It's quite a small model that we've got for the number of data points. And so we don't really think there's much of a risk of overfitting to those anomalies. We think that the model is small enough that it can probably generalize well enough that it's, it's quite immune to random kind of bad data points here and there. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I think it's, um, yeah, more on, on, the, on the user personality. Maybe you could feed it into some sort of credit score or something like that. I don't know. You know, like they're, they're lying to you. That's not <laughs> the one. And um, Benjamin's in the chat there saying they only drink coffee, not water. It's piped straight into their house. Um, so, yeah, maybe that is you know, accurate. I, I'm probably the same on some days uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of needing a coffee. And um, I think one of the things that, um, just to call out, um, you know, the closeness of the teams, um, seems to have been a you know a big factor actually in you discovering um, you know s some of these you know interesting points to look into and stuff like that. And could you just briefly tell us a little bit more about you know how the teams work at Clio um, to, to basically get the most out of you know data science projects like this? Yeah, so um, you know we work and um, we work mostly in, in cross-functional squads, and the squads are. Um, the squads each have an area of the product that they're looking at. So this squad that I was in at the time um, was looking at the budget and there were a few data scientists, but there were also front end engineers, back end engineers, as I said, all the roles that we said. And that really meant that we were, I think, sensitive to, you know, keeping our eyes on the big prize. Um, and, you know, from what I've seen in you know, other organizations and in, in before I joined Clio was that, you know, data science teams you might give, you might outsource kind of some OKR to a data science team, and then it gets translated into some fairly abstract performance metric that actually is a bit decoupled from what's ultimately valuable for the business. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect, mate. Thank you very much. Um, again, just just as I was um, watching along there, I was wondering, you know, are, are you using the user chat flow um, data to evaluate performance? It mm -hmm. is, is that that is something that that's being done as well okay um does the way does the way you change the sampling um make the evaluation data more difficult to to get right yeah so that's that's a good point so i guess that's the idea that you know we are we're some we, we before we went from a method where we were kind of just randomly sampling and that was giving us a representative picture of our users and then suddenly we're changing the way that we're sampling that which means that we are more, we're, we're targeting the predictions that are harder to get right so if you kind of if you then assess a machine learning model's performance using that kind of biased data set it's going to deflate performance it's going to look worse than it is and luckily for us actually one of the things that the product teams do is we have a, a holdout uh, user set um, and this is normally so we can as we're working over features and we're doing a b tests over the quarter we can see there's one group of users who have had none of these changes applied to them and it's useful to understand if all of the changes that we're making incrementally are adding value. And so we were able to use that, that holdout user set to basically have a baseline that was unaffected. So we're using them for performance evaluation and we're using the sampling that, we, that we're changing to kind of build the training set. Yeah, I, th I thought it was super interesting actually in terms of, it's almost like you're giving the users ownership um you know in terms of their own data and, and it mm. almost feels like the users have gone well this is great you know i'm part of the process mm. um you know i'm almost taking ownership for budgeting so that, that was really interesting and um, i guess in terms of um knowing the team at clio well you you, you know you don't rest for, for a minute there, there's lots going on in the data world at clio and um, you know what, what does the six next six months or so look like um you know in, in terms of this have, have you got a roadmap ahead of you have you got extra things that you'd like to you know take on within this project yeah, so this project actually, um, we're still working on it, but we're the next six months, we're kind of we're shifting focus slightly to, you know, we're still, you know, building out the things here that I mentioned that we're building out. Um, but we're also as a data science kind of function, we're focusing on some other things. So uh, an example for that is we're, we're starting to kind of use machine learning to 
prevent fraud. Um, you know, we have a few services um, that, you know, could potentially attract fraudsters. And so using machine learning to kind of build fraud, fraud scoring for them is something that we're doing. Um, something maybe that's more related to this, which is something that we're not necessarily doing right now, but within six months are very likely to be doing is, um, you know, this, a lot of this touches on the relationship users have with Clio. And there's a team that's kind of working out how to build those longer term relationships. And so we have projects um, with quite kind of exotic ideas, for example, maybe even reinforcement learning to work out what engagement to kind of send or prompt a user with at what time just to maximize their overall kind of retention and engagement. Um, so that's something that's really interesting. That's probably yeah, not this quarter, but next quarter we're looking at as well. Yeah, fantastic. Sounds sounds good. A um, couple of comments just into, into the chat. Um, so first of all, from uh, Juan, uh, great presentation, Josh. Uh, good to see something on data centric ML highlights a key part on an ML workflow uh, for good ML performance. So th thanks for jumping in there, Juan, uh, and making that comment. And um, we do have a question there from uh, Zahir. Um, and it seems rude while we have you, Josh, not to pick your brain a little bit further, but Zahir's question is a little bit wider um, in terms of interviewing, um, you know, as a data scientist and I guess how Clio approached that. So um, Zahir was asking, what are the qualities you look for uh, when, when recruiting a new data scientist in your team? Uh, and what is the common mistake you see candidates make at the interview stage? Uh, I know it's somewhat of an offshoot, mm -hmm. but I'm curious about your point of view. No, so. no, it's, yeah, it's an excellent question. So, you know, as I said, we're doing a lot of interviews you know with the roles we have open we're doing a lot of interviewing right now um i would say you know from having gone through interviews myself at a lot of other companies i think you know sometimes they go a bit deeper into like you know how does how does how do neural networks work and you know what's the technical you know difference between bagging and boosting that kind of thing um and sometimes that stuff comes up but often our interviews and the questions are more focused on the kind of yeah, the, the in what it, it, looking at what a model is being used for in the real world, and then relating weaknesses or strengths in modeling in models and modeling techniques to those real world impacts. So, thinking about things like you know bias in a model being used in this domain, how might that impact the end user? Not in a Clio context, in some other business context. Um, so yeah, I'd say that the the kind of the most yeah the most common mistakes perhaps is is trying to focus too much on the, uh, in those questions, especially is kind of, you know, going into here's how you train a model, here's how you do hyperparameter hyper uh, tuning, um, instead of kind of maybe asking questions about what's the business context and how might that weigh into what it means for the question, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's super, super, super uh, valuable, actually. And uh, as you say, relating it to that real world uh, instead of just the tech. And you, you see lots of conversations around the softer skills as a data scientist as mm. well. But um, it, it really is it really is worth, um, you know, you know, highlighting as well, isn't it? So, um, man, I think we are probably at the point, unless there's any final questions jumping at the last minute that we start to, to wrap things up. And um, I think I said to you before the session, uh, Josh, th these lunchtime sessions, I really enjoy them because we do kind of keep it while people are having their break. Uh, mm -hmm. perhaps grabbing a sandwich or whatever and then they're back into into real life for their two o'clock uh, two o'clock zoom meetings or, or whatever so um, just as we're wrapping things up um, I know Josh just did uh, you know did plug uh, the Clio careers site um, yeah, I, I'd reiterate that. Um, you may well end up speaking uh, speaking with one of the talent people there, a guy called Aaron. Uh, absolutely lovely. He'll sort you out and take you all through the interview process, start to finish, and, and make you feel uh, very happy with everything that's going on. So uh, please do check them out. And um, we do also have um, Clio involved in our main stage uh, in person event, which is on the 27th of November. So if you are able to get to London uh, for the 27th of November, I would highly recommend. Uh, registering for a ticket for that one and uh, come along in real life um, and uh, say hello to some of the Clio team. So uh, we've put a couple of links in the chat uh, for, for the Clio careers uh, and also for the live data science festival, um, which brings me, Josh, just to wrap things up. And uh, as I say, th thank you for giving up your time. Um, I do say this with all of the speakers, you know, it's, it's not just the time uh, of coming on a lunchtime to, to present. Uh, I, I'm very well aware there's a lot of preparation to pull the slide deck together. Uh, a lot of thought goes into what you want to share. Um, and also a lot of practice behind the scenes to make sure it all flows uh, so freely. So um, thank you very much, uh, Josh. I hope you've, uh, you know, how, how was it?
was it for you? How, how have you enjoyed your lunchtime with the Data Science Festival? Yeah, no, it was a, it was a great experience. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's a really interesting um, topic that we've kind of, you know, we're, we're thrilled with the learnings that we've had on it since we've kind of realised all this stuff. So, yeah, it's just great to share. Share it with the community. Well, we, we really do appreciate it, mate. So um, thank you again for your time. Uh, thank you all for joining us at home. And, uh, yeah, hope to see you all again very soon, either online uh, or in person. But, yeah, we'll draw it to a close now. And thanks very much, Josh, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Goodbye.